Nothing on the Bonnell Foundation's Living with Cystic Fibrosis podcast should be considered medical advice. Medical advice can only come from your CF physician. Cystic fibrosis can be a devastating diagnosis, but living with the disease can bring positivity and a new appreciation for each day. From the Bonnell Foundation in Detroit, Michigan, it's the Living with Cystic Fibrosis podcast, sponsored by Vertex Pharmaceutical. Here's your host, Laura Bonnell. The Bonnell Foundation awarded its first fellowship grant in 2021 in honor of Dr. Samia Nasser at the University of Michigan. She is a pediatric pulmonologist there. And the reason the Bonnell Foundation decided to start a fellowship grant is because of the outstanding work that Dr. Nasser has done both here in Michigan, the United States, and in her country of descent that is in Egypt. The other reason was because of the information that we will just touch on here, and that's Drs. Lumeng and Dr. Saba and what they're about to provide. Nationally, there is a concern that the pediatric pulmonology workforce will not be sufficient to meet the needs of children with respiratory disease. And the concern is that particularly acute in the state of Michigan, which has 1.26 board certified pediatric pulmonologists per 100,000 children, which is below the national average of 1.5. In addition to the technical information that the doctors joining us today will explain, they'll also explain what they're going to be doing with the fellowship grant. Joining us are Dr. Carrie Lumang, a professor of pediatrics and the interim director of the Division of Pulmonary Medicine. And he sees patients at C.S. Mott Children's Hospital, which, of course, is the University of Michigan, along with Dr. Thomas Saba, who is both an assistant director of pediatric residency program and the program director of the Pediatric Pulmonology Fellowship Coordinator. So both doctors have so much more in their titles, but we did want to get to them right away so that we could talk about this fellowship grant that is going to help in the future. So Dr. Lu Meng and Dr. Saba, thanks for joining us today. And why don't you tell us more about what this grant is? Yeah, great. Thanks, uh, Ms. Bennell, for letting us join you today and uh, talk to you about the grant and and what we do as pediatric pulmonologists and what we think the impact of this can be on uh, the care of CF patients, not only in Michigan, but also throughout the country. Let me tell you, it's it's always gets confusing a little bit about, you know, the train that you need to become a pediatric pulmonologist and to care for CF patients. For myself, for example, I went through training through medical school, and then I did a residency in pediatrics where I learned to take care of kids. Um, And then at some point, I would have said, well, I wanted to take care of kids with lung disease and make that a major part of my career, which, of course, involves also caring for patients with cystic fibrosis. And so, you know, after completing two rounds of, you know, seven years of training in medical school and and, and residency, I uh, proceeded on to do uh, what's called a pediatric pulmonology fellowship to get three years where all I did was learn how to take care of patients with lung disease, including those with cystic fibrosis. And I'll I'll let Dr. Saba describe that training program as well. But um, I think what we have learned is that's a really important period of growth for young physicians. Um, It helps develop not only their ability to learn how to care for patients and families uh, dealing with cystic fibrosis, um, but it's also a way for them to kind of find out what's going to be their future and ways that they can contribute to not only um, helping children and families uh, with cystic fibrosis live much longer lives and higher quality of life, but also to learn how to make, you know, the next great leap in cystic fibrosis care. I'll let Dr. Sabo, as the director of the fellowship program, talk about why we are prioritizing having extra funding and philanthropy to support the fellows. Um, But from my perspective, I think it's a really important way for us to enhance what our trainees can uh, learn throughout this important period of time. Uh, Tom, do you want to talk a little bit about the fellowship program more specifically? Yeah, of course. Yeah, thanks for that. And Mrs. Bennell, we we also want to just express our gratitude to the Bennell Foundation for this very, very generous gift, which is extremely important in the training of of young people learning the skills and competencies to become pediatric pulmonologists. The traditional training program is three years, and typically this is somebody who has already graduated medical school and then graduated a residency program and they decide that they want to devote their lives to studying and caring for children with chronic lung diseases like cystic fibrosis. And so it is a lot of training in the hospital whereby we train people about how to take care of diseases, how to understand children and their families and care for them as a whole and not just care for their conditions. But another really big part of the training is research. And our fellows do some really excellent research 
in cystic fibrosis and in basic science research in the lab, studying the mechanisms of asthma and other chronic lung diseases. And we've noticed over the last several years that in order to train somebody to become a pediatric pulmonologist, well, there are many factors that come into play. We have to train them to understand the complicated lung physiology. We have to train them to understand people, to have good bedside manner, to take good care of themselves, to maintain a good work-life balance. But one of the biggest challenges is modifying the training program to align with the new knowledge in cystic fibrosis and asthma and all the really exciting new things that have come around in pediatric pulmonology in the last few years, we have to be creative in changing how we teach these fellows so that they're learning cutting edge science. And so we might talk about this more in a few minutes, but this particular gift from the Bennell Foundation is going to do exactly that. It's going to equip us with tools and resources and ways to train our fellows to become experts, nationwide experts in CF and other forms of chronic lung diseases, and to modify our training in accordance with the new knowledge and the demands of our population, and to do the absolute best we can to take care of our patients in the future. And it's so exciting um, what could happen from here. And by the way, you can both call me Laura. I am still going to be calling you Dr. Saba and Dr. <laughs> Lumeng because you know, um, that's just the way it should be, but um, I appreciate it. But I am excited about the potential of what you can do with this grant. Um, how are you getting started with this? We're still exploring the best ways to employ the uh, generous donation um, and making sure that it's, it's gone in the right places. So, you know, I, I think we've thought about several different areas that we think we can use it on, and, and we're trying to decide on which one of these uh, to emphasize for the first year. First of all is certainly making sure that the um, pulmonologists in training are exposed to as much of the state-of-the-art treatments for cystic fibrosis, for example, as possible, supporting their ability to attend the CF Foundation Conference, supporting their ability to attend regional conferences, and also get new opportunities to interact with uh, the experts in the field uh, that we have about the mission and also throughout the country. Um, secondly, uh, you know, given that this is named after Dr. Samia Nasser, who's one of our uh, senior and most accomplished cystic fibrosis pulmonologists here, is to train our pulmonologists to understand diverse populations and diversity and the impact that CF can have, not just in the United States, but also around the world. And I think that's a really unique position for us to do and, and is something that really doesn't have specific support systems at the University of Michigan or the training to promote. Uh, finally, obviously, as Dr. Saba mentioned, uh, supporting the ability to do research. As people know, research takes some money to kind of be able to answer your question and ask the right question. And so we think that uh, we have many exciting projects that our fellows are doing, and some of them uh, may have enough funding, but others may be underfunded. So we feel that they may be an opportunity to enhance the funding we have to let the fellows do research and learn how to ask questions and answer questions. And finally, and potentially most importantly, that we're trying to figure out is um, ways that we can provide experiences for the next generation beyond just the fellows uh, and encouraging both medical students and residents, so those who have yet decided to go into pediatric pulmonology, enhance their experiences so they can make a decision and hopefully uh, promote uh, a career in taking care of CF patients. And again, the reason we're so enthusiastic about uh, these opportunities is that as an overall field, we have some concerns that we're not going to have enough pediatric pulmonologists to treat all the patients that we have unless we really groom them and, and, and build their experiences. And, you know, this is a really important time to build those skills. Uh, both Dr. Saba and myself were fellows here, what we call fellows, um, in the pulmonary program. So I learned for three years side by side with Dr. Nasser how to care for CF patients. And that's not just which medicines to use, but it's also how to approach the families, how to talk to the families, how to talk to the patients, how to see our patients throughout all the life changes from uh, having a newborn baby diagnosed with CF and all the challenges of, of having to deal with that to having a teenager <laughs> with CF that is mm -hmm. learning how to become a young adult, um, to then uh, having an adult and thankfully an adult transition out of our pediatric clinic to the adult clinic. And all of those take a very specific skill set and a way to work with patients that we've all learned through that period of time. And um, I, I think there are opportunities for us to really bring more people into the fold to make sure we have enough of doctors to train in those uh, skills over time. 
And Dr. Saba, I was going to say, going off what Dr. Lemeng was saying, you're our family. You are our people. All of you, we are so connected to all of you. And it's so exciting about the up and coming pulmonologist that you're going to have. It's very exciting. Laura, it's a great point. And we really appreciate when patients acknowledge that this is really a family a family approach here, we feel as though our patients are part of our family and vice versa. Well, unfortunately, we're learning over the last few years that there might be a deficiency in pediatric pulmonologists in this country in the next 10 years. The current pediatric pulmonologists are aging and retiring. And unfortunately, it doesn't appear as though we are recruiting people into this field at a rate fast enough to meet the demands of our population. Our cystic fibrosis patients need us. Our asthma patients need us. There are new conditions being diagnosed all the time. E-cigarette and vaping-associated lung injury, for example, is a new condition we learned about two years ago. Well, we need experts to study that. Babies are born more and more premature and surviving what they weren't able to survive many years ago. Well, they need a pulmonologist to manage their chronic lung diseases. There's going to be a demand for pediatric pulmonologists in the future that we might not be able to meet unless we take a very aggressive and innovative approach to recruiting some of the top medical students and residents into this field. And this is where the Bunnell Foundation grant is extremely important. What we will hope to use some of these funds for is exactly that, designing really unique and innovative recruitment and training models that will make people learn about the really amazing and wonderful field of pediatric pulmonology, how great a life it is, how interesting the science is, and how absolutely rewarding it is to take care of these patients and their families for many, many years. We wanna go out and show the residents uh, that we have great and unique research models. We wanna look at recruiting people from underrepresented minorities. We want to improve our diversity in the work field. Uh, we want to make sure we establish really strong wellness initiatives because fellowship over three years is a very stressful time for a young person. We want to make sure we're taking good care of our fellows so that they can take care of themselves and their families and most importantly, their patients. So we certainly have a challenge ahead of us and this particular gift came at a very important time and we're going to use it to make sure that we maintain a very steady stream of future pediatric pulmonologists to meet the needs of our patients and their families in the future. And to either one of you, is it correct when I think now about all the people that have yet to be diagnosed, um, African Americans, people of Asian descent, um, people like Dr. Nasser has been diagnosing in Egypt, I don't think there's 30,000 people, right, that have CF. There has to be probably double that. I mean, the population, it seems like, is going to grow because so many have been misdiagnosed. Is that a correct assessment? Yeah, I, I don't know if they've been misdiagnosed. I think there's been a delay in diagnosis. Um, I guess because many of these communities haven't thought about it as a part of um, their community. And, you know, I, I'd say this is not only a problem in the Middle East, as you as you kind of mentioned, we're a very diverse community in Southeast Michigan, and we have a large number of cystic fibrosis patients of all ethnicities uh, and, and races. And so I think we ourselves have seen that, and that's been a unique challenge. Fortunately, with newborn screening uh, done in the United States and in Michigan, we've been able to capture them quicker and identify their potential problems quicker and also intervene to improve their lives better. But that's another important learning learning point for all of our uh, trainees as well. And what we also found is there are many other conditions that are underdiagnosed. And I'll give you an example of a condition called primary ciliary dyskinesia. And this is a chronic lung disease where children have chronic infections of the lungs and their sinuses. And in many ways, it's very similar to cystic fibrosis. Well, the Primary Ciliary Dyskinesia Foundation over the last few years has looked at the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation for guidance and looked to see what all the doctors were doing to diagnose and treat patients with cystic fibrosis. And sure enough, by learning what we've done for cystic fibrosis patients, we were able to learn a lot about this similar condition, PCD for short. And by using some of the models in cystic fibrosis, we were able to learn that 
the incidence of PCD in this country is probably double what we originally thought it would be. So not only is it important for us to learn about the really greater incidence of CF worldwide, but in the same way, we're learning about a number of other conditions and helping to really diagnose and treat children with chronic medical conditions that they never knew they had and increasing the life expectancy and the quality of life of many children who don't have CF, but looking to CF as a model. Very interesting. And I also wonder, it must be refreshing to you to kind of get these new pulmonologists because they have a lot of questions maybe, or they make you think about things maybe that you revisit or you think, oh, I never thought about that. It must go both ways, right? Absolutely. I mean, most of my time is spent as a researcher. And researchers, we, we fundamentally just want, like to ask why. <laughs> why is something happening? And, um, you know, fortunately, there was a time in cystic fibrosis prior to Francis Collins finding the CFTR gene. The biggest question was, why did these patients uh, with CF get sick? Um, and we've made such huge uh, advances based on just asking the question, why? And we see that all the time in our trainees. So in terms of taking care of patients, why do we use this treatment versus that treatment? Why is two siblings, for example, one have worse lung function than the other? Um, and what can we do about it? How can we learn about it? That's really, really excites us, um, especially with CF becoming a different disease and a, a different type of disease, we hope, in the future. Um, we really need people to keep asking why. And that, to me, is, is the important part of um, having extra resources to let people ask questions. Unfortunately, research nowadays, there are lots of good questions out there uh, to ask why, but not uh, unfortunately because of the way funding is for research. People don't always have the opportunity to try to ask that question and answer it. And what we're hoping for is to build enough uh, resources in uh, the Bunnell grant to be able to let people ask the question why more frequently and easily. Now, having a vibrant and alive fellowship program really breathes a lot of life into the division. It truly does. So Dr. Lumeng is maybe considered mostly a researcher. Similarly, I'm considered mostly a teacher. I spend a lot of my time doing teaching. And teaching, I really do think, makes me a much better pulmonologist. I'm expected to be up to date on all of the medical knowledge. And by teaching something to somebody, you really become an expert yourself. So, yes, yeah, sometimes people think, you know, having residents and fellows in the hospital, it slows things down a little bit. But in all honesty, what it does is it really demands a lot from the faculty members to be up to date on everything, to provide the best cutting edge knowledge and care to all of our patients. And so this gift actually, by breathing some a little bit of extra life into our fellowship program, it'll really invigorate our faculty and our division to provide great care for our patients. Um, our fellows ask great questions. They have some really novel and interesting ideas. We have a new fellow every single year, and that new fellow has really unique ideas that nobody thought of before. And that just really keeps our division very active. And we just love having a fellowship program. And well, we really do think it allows us to provide great care to our patients. And I have to say from the patient perspective, they're young, they're so fresh, they come into the room all bubbly. Some are nervous, some are excited. But my kids always liked it because they were so young and they were like, oh, you know, it, it just seemed that they really connected with them. And you could tell if they were like, oh, they were learning something. Or even with my girls, oh, two kids with CF. It was just interesting to see some of them as they understood that, oh, yeah, it's really common to have more than one child with CF and things like that. What do you think, or I guess what excites you the most about maybe what's coming in this field? Is it CF modulators, new specialty drugs, something that will, because, you know, with my girls, the triple combo works for one daughter, but not for the other. They have the same mutation. So, you know, you probably understand it more than I do, but still have a long way to go, even though we've come a long way. Yeah. So obviously there's certainly lots of um, individuals with mutations that are not currently covered by the current modulators. Uh, thank goodness that this uh, clinical pipeline is still very, very strong in terms of developing new medications. But uh, again, as these get rarer and rarer, it still becomes a challenge in terms of doing the right study and finding enough patients for these studies. 
So I, I think certainly there's a lot more work to do on modulators. My research interests actually are related to nutrition and metabolism. And while these modulators certainly help a lot of the lung problems, uh, a lot of the growth issues and metabolism issues in CF patients are still uh, not clearly addressed uh, by a lot of these. So a lot of my interest actually in what I my research on, which is why is lung health and nutritional health linked together? Um, and so I think that's certainly an area for expansion and for new questions and very basic questions that we still are trying to ask at the University of Michigan. So uh, one of our uh, faculty, Lindsay Caverly, is an expert on non-tuberculous mycobacterium, which is a d- new type of infection that we're still not sure if the modulators will, number one, will that help those who already have these strange infections? Or number two, will they even prevent them at all? And uh, the numbers right now suggest that that may be a problem that we're still along with for a while. And the, the challenges of trying to understand how do we treat or should we treat and when should we treat a patient with these atypical infections is still something we're actively trying to understand. And Dr. Cavalli is really leading some of the efforts nationally in terms of trying to answer that question, which I think is very, very important. And towards that end, we have some of our fellows are working alongside of her to learn how to answer that question. So again, this is another way that we can bring the next generation into asking why and giving them really the top-notch training to ask why. So those are things that I'm, I'm really excited about. Um, I'm sure there are educational things that Dr. Saba can talk about that maybe are, are also exciting. There are so many questions out there, Laura. And, you know, although it does seem promising that we have these new drugs and therapies on the market, with every new discovery comes about 15 other questions. And our fellows are often the ones asking these questions. And we, and Dr. Lu Meng and I sometimes think to ourselves, well, that's a great question. I never really thought of it that way because we've been doing this for so long. For example, one of our fellows right now had a patient with um, an infection called Pseudomonas. And, and I'm sure many people on the podcast are familiar with this infection, but there's many different species of Pseudomonas and they all affect the lungs in a different way. So our fellow, one of our fellows is trying to find out, do different types of Pseudomonas cause the same degree of lung injury? And she's studying that. Another one of our fellows who just graduated was trying to figure out whether an exercise program would be helpful for people with cystic fibrosis. The same types of exercise programs that, you know, you and I probably do periodically just using our Peloton or whatever types of apps that we use. Is that helpful specifically for people who have CF? So, you know, there are a lot of really high level research questions about uh, triple modulator therapy and why one patient does better than another patient. But there are so many you know, maybe simpler questions that we look at every single day, but don't really think of what types of questions we really need to ask to find an answer. And our fellows are so great at thinking of those questions that Dr. Lu Meng and I sometimes take for granted. We don't even, you know, kind of consider those things because some things just uh, seem routine for us. Now, to get back to your question about, you know, why one patient would do well on a modulator and another one wouldn't with the same genotype, boy, CF is such a complex disease. There's thousands and thousands of genes in the genome, which can all be affected differently, you know, among siblings. And those genes might modify the CFTR protein in various ways. So much to learn, so much to learn, so much research to do. And that's one of the things we will use this grant for, is to use this funding for different research ideas for some of our incoming fellows. And isn't it exciting? I was just looking back on the history of CF. And so when my oldest was born in 1994, 27 years ago, there was not newborn screening. So it wasn't diagnosed through newborn screening. It was diagnosed from us. But I also think the sweat test was then available. And it hasn't been around that long, really. So we're so lucky that this disease has kind of progressed pretty quickly, I think. You know, as we continue to ask people to donate so we can double and eventually triple and et cetera, this grant... What is your dream of maybe where this grant can go and grow and what it could become? So I'll speak for myself and then Dr. Tom can talk about his dream in terms of things. My pie in the sky vision of this is that we'll be able to actually use these funds if they're big enough to actually train more fellows than we are actually training. It's an interesting aspect. The University of Michigan, for example, has a limited number of individuals that can train in these fellowship type of, uh, of scenarios to get advanced training. And then, you know, we train hundreds of individuals for specialties and we just have to spread the wealth around. So even though we have the capacity to train more, more than the three fellows we're currently training a year, we don't have the funding available from the educational office to bring in another trainee. 
And we also have a significant interest in more people wanting to train at University of Michigan. We've just been unable to find the resources to bring in more people to train. So my goal of this ultimately, at least my goal, I don't know if I told this to Dr. Saba yet, is if we can build this fund large, large enough, we'll be able to really solve the problem that we're, we're challenging in, which is how do we build the workforce and be able to care for more patients with cystic fibrosis throughout the country. And, um, you know, our fellowship program has ended an excellent job of this. Um, our graduates are not only at the University of Michigan, like myself and Dr. Saba, but they're in San Francisco, they're in Texas, they're in Utah, they're in Wisconsin. They're contributing to CF care throughout the United States. And so doubling our capacity to do that, to go from three to five to six fellows every year to train, um, I think would be my pie in the sky dream. I don't know if Dr. Saba agrees with that, but maybe he wants to go to 20, 20 per year or something like that. But. Yeah, we certainly have um, the clinical opportunities to train more people. But the problem is that it's always a money issue and the institution is doing their very best to help us uh, pay for these fellows, but they've allowed us to only take one per year. But certainly if we were to get some external funding, we would be able to train them. We have enough people, we have enough patients, we have the research infrastructure to be able to support more fellows. Now, to put this into perspective, the Bunnell Foundation grant, although extremely generous, is but a starting point. And if we really wanted to gain some traction here and truly make this not just, you know, a nice little thing for one fellow to benefit from, if we truly wanted to make this a longitudinal commitment to train more fellows, to diversify our research interests, to diversify the global impact of Michigan doctors treating cystic fibrosis, the fund will have to grow. I mean, there'll have to be more donations to be able to train more fellows and to expand our reach. Uh, we have you know, the knowledge and the experience to be able to do so. This is a wonderful and very large first step, but uh, a first step among many nonetheless. And I know you touched on this, but how, or does it come naturally? Um, do you personalize with the new pulmonologists, the fellows, as far as kind of being down to earth? Like it's, this is something you already know as doctors. Uh, my daughters consider Dr. Nasser family. Like I said, like they'll always hug her when they see her. They begged her not to make them go to the adult clinic because, <laughs> you know, they wanted to stay with her in peds. But of course, that's just part of, you know, growing up with CF and it, and had to do, and now they have new relationships there in the adult clinic. But how do you kind of train for that? Can you, or do they just figure it out? Well, that's why number one takes three years <laughs> to figure this out. Number two, I think, um, Honestly, a lot of those things are still making sure that we are good role models for how to work with patients and parents themselves. And I think we're fortunate enough that I think all of our fellows, as they're trained, have patients that they've identified through newborn screening. And you go through, you know, one of the probably toughest times of any parent's life, which when they get a test back or the sweat test back on a newborn baby and trying to learn how to deal with the new diagnosis. Um, you can't just throw anybody at that <laughs> without preparation. And so I know, and I know Dr. Saba does, when we do a lot of preparing about, you know, this is what this patient is going through, this parent is going through. We have certain goals that we want to do, and this is how you have to build that relationship. And, you know, I, I certainly remember when I, I was the same part at uh, of this stage as other trainees were, but now, you know, patients that I was involved with the initial diagnosis of are now teenagers and graduating high school, and it's really been a valuable uh, part of it. But I, I think I've learned every step of the way. And so to me, it's being immersed in it. Um, it's having good role models like Dr. Saba, Dr. Nasser, and our other senior faculty, and also having the ability to catapult off that to, again, to, to me again, ask questions, why? Why do we do this? Why don't we do this? What is needed to kind of help kids uh, and their parents go through these different you know, challenges over their lifespan? Tom, I'll let you add anything else that you feel. I couldn't imagine. So it must be so difficult for a parent to transition care for, for their child to a completely different doctor. It is. <laughs> oh, boy, I can imagine, Laura. So, you know, our fellows, uh, boy, that's the part of medicine that is really hard to learn from a textbook. So that's why exactly as Dr. Lu Meng said, it takes many years to train a pediatric pulmonary fellow. Because not only is there a lot of like scientific content to learn, 
but you really have to learn the impact of these conditions on the child and on her family. And that takes a long time. It takes years to get to know how it impacts people. And hopefully by the end of our fellowship training, we will have instilled some of that knowledge and some of those skills on our fellows that, you know, these are really, um, you can't just treat patients based on their disease and based on the numbers you get from the labs and the pulmonary function tests. A good part of taking good care of a patient is understanding really and empathizing what that person is going through um, with their family. A very difficult thing to teach. Uh, indeed it is. Yeah, I appreciate that. Well, thank you both. Is there anything you wanted to end with, either something we didn't touch on or something you're hoping for in regard to this grant before we wrap it up here? Um, no, beyond just thanking you for uh, spearheading this effort and for supporting um, our division. And uh, if people have questions or uh, thoughts or ideas, actually, about where research should go or where we should put our efforts Please feel free to contact myself or Dr. Saba through our division. And um, I love to ask why <laughs> and try to find solutions. So it's fun for us to work with the patients and the parents to uh, help with these efforts. And I, I love the fact that this foundation decided not only to give the donation to an organization researching cystic fibrosis, but to make a donation as an investment in medical education. Because what people sometimes don't recognize is to get great medical care, to have really innovative and amazing medical solutions, it all comes from proper training. And training from the first day they enter the hospital, learning how to be a doctor, investing in that, investing in educating people properly and giving them the right tools to become experts and, and make really big impacts. I think that's one of the best ways to really make an impact on a condition like cystic fibrosis, for example. So really appreciate that investment from the Benel Foundation. And we will work with you and with anybody who else who wants to help contribute to this mission. We are here as servants to help you, to help the patients. And we would love to hear some feedback and get some guidance from any of you on to how you, you all think this ought to be used to best take care of these patients in the future. Dr. Carrie Lumang and Dr. Thomas Saba, thank you both so much. I appreciate this, and we will definitely watch this grant grow and continue to help more our future pulmonologists. Great. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. The original music in this podcast is performed by Kevin Allen. It's not complicated. Who happens to have cystic fibrosis. We all got our worries and fears. I know what's got you frustrated. But loving you is so all right. This has been the Living with Cystic Fibrosis podcast. For more information and to learn more about the Bonnell Foundation, check them out online at thebonnellfoundation.org. That's B-O-N-N-E-L-L foundation.org. This podcast was sponsored by Vertex Pharmaceutical, the science of possibility, and produced by Jag and Detroit Podcasts, 